Hmm. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the data driven approach to digital transformation in corporate legal teams. Um, and effectively, we have a little uh, tagline there in results we trust, uh, brought to you by Contract Pod AI. And, uh, and hosted by Cosmonauts. So thank you everybody for joining us and we will get started uh, promptly as I think we are two minutes over and we were just uh, giving everybody an opportunity to join the, uh, the meeting before getting moving. So with us today, let me just start off with the, uh, the panelists who are going to be speaking. Um, so I, I guess I'll start. I am uh, Charles Dimov. I'm the Vice President of Mar Global Marketing here at Contract Pod AI. In Contract Pod AI, basically we create a uh, CLM, a Contract Lifecycle Management System, um, with what we are very proud to call the five Ds of AI, so five dimensions of AI. In any case, I won't talk further about that. With that, let me pass it over to George. George, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, certainly. So my name is George Barlow. I'm the Associate Director of uh, legal engineering at Contract Pod AI. Um, I've been with Contract Pod for just about a year now, and prior to that, I was a senior in house counsel um, at Aviva PLC for about 16 years. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Jerry, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Thank you, George. Hi, I'm Jerry Levine. I'm the general counsel and corporate secretary of, uh, of what is now Amelia, uh, an IP soft company. Uh, I've been here for about five years, and I'm happy to share our parts of our journey and talk about digital transformation. Fantastic. Thank you. We're excited to hear about that. And Ben, can you introduce yourself as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Ben Chilito. Um, uh, I'm now head of legal at Fujitsu UK, and I run our global uh, legal services team, which is an offshore team of lawyers um, and technology and operations specialists who support Fujitsu's global legal and commercial operations. All right. So we've got a, uh, a good diverse panel here of um, some large international plays, uh, good AI technology, uh, actually AI technology squared, let's say, uh, for both Contract Pod and Amelia, which is good. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. And why don't we move on? So the first thing I'll do is I, I just want to kind of introduce the topic and, and sort of uh, touch on it a bit. There were two interesting things that kind of came up in a, a recent uh, Gartner study. And one of those was the um, legal automation. So there was a, a paper on legal automation a few months back, and it had actually reported that 89% of organizations uh, either met or exceeded their expected ROI on the uh, legal automation technology. So again, very interesting to, to read that um, when we know very much that a lot of times when we're speaking to you know different folks on legal teams, uh, different uh, general counsels, we often find that there's a little bit of a reticence about saying, well, you know, is this really going to pay off? How am I going to position this? And is there a business case for this? And definitely from the Gartner research, uh, it's quite clear that, in fact, um, most of the companies who have been diving into legal automation have found it quite fruitful. And their original estimates of their ROI actually have come to, to, to fruition. They've actually come to, to bear, which is great, which, of course, leads into that next uh, statistic there that you see on the screen, the 73%. In which case, um, again, the same Gartner study had asked executives about saying, would you back up uh, or would you be open to investments on the legal in the legal space for, for your legal department, for example, doesn't make sense for your company. And again, the answer that uh, the Gartner study had got back was 73% of executives said yes, that they would actually back that up. And I think also the study went on to a couple of other statements that they had made about how uh, speed, for example, was one of the highest priorities amongst uh, general counsels and amongst the the, uh, the attorneys within the companies. Um, so just getting things out there as quickly as possible. Uh, and of course, that old tagline about um, you know doing more for less um, also resonated very, very strongly throughout that paper. So again, very interesting stats because a lot of times we do feel that many in many companies, there is still that feeling that, well, the legal team is more of a cost center. It's not really a, a business driver, in which case, you know, we have to be cautious about too many asks and such. However, as I said, it does look very much like more and more businesses are coming to the table and saying, no, we are actually prepared to spend some money. 
as long as we see that ROI. And frankly, from that Gartner paper, it looks very, very clear that the ROI definitely is there and it's achievable. Now, with that as a bit of a uh, proviso or a, a kind of a starter for that data-driven approach on digital transformation, so when we're bringing in an automation, for example, I thought it would be great to, to hear from a general counsel who has actually gone through this process. And um, and so my, my choice for this was uh, Jerry Levine, uh, because Jerry actually is super friendly to me and basically says yes whenever I ask him to do these crazy things. And uh, so Jerry, could I ask you to kind of jump in here and take us through the journey that Amelia went through uh, when you were kind of bringing in, you brought in a CLM system. And uh, and so just take us through that, the challenges, solution, your results. Sure. Uh, uh, hopefully I got my mic back on and everyone can hear me. It sounds um, so a, a bit about this. I've actually been through this a number of times. Uh, this is uh, actually, this, even though I've been here for five years, this is my fourth, maybe fifth time setting up contract management or dealing with a number of disparate systems that different companies use for contract management. Um, so having dealt with this for a while, there's always, you're, you're always dealing with the same, uh, very similar challenges. You know, one is, and I'm not ashamed to say this, a lot of attorneys are very much stuck in the 90s and I don't mean the 1990s, I mean the 1890s in terms of their, in terms of how they manage contracts, how they manage law departments. And especially for outside counsel, it's also very hard. Uh, one thing this pandemic has shown, by the way, for me at least, is who is a tech savvy and tech forward law firm, law departments, but also shown us who's not so, not so good at that and who's struggling a lot. Uh, so when I started here at IPsoft, there was no contract management whatsoever. It was a fi it, there are still actually giant filing cabinets outside my office filled with paper that no one has touched for a long time. But there was everything was stored in a folder in an internal SharePoint site that no one can touch. We went forward about five years ago. We selected a different vendor that, you know, we were not that seemed to do a job, but it turned out to just be another SharePoint, which led us to ContractPod AI and how better ways to manage this. And what we've seen is that there are significant key things that departments, law departments need to avoid and need to move past. Yeah. One, in the pandemic especially, but generally, people are working from home more, more than ever now especially, but they need to be able to access what they're working on. Two, you need to be able to collaborate, collaborate with your peers and oftentimes others outside the organization. And three, we really need to automate all of this. Now, this is funny because I am the general counsel of what is a one of the world's leading automation and artificial intelligence companies. Mm -hmm. So automation here is not just for, for Amelia and for IPsoft, automation isn't just, you know, oh, we want to automate things. Our job is automating things. That's what our software does. It makes things like that work. Uh, and I'm not, you know, one of the things that we've had to get through is, is how do you automate a process that is very much still a manual review process? And how do we move, move things forward quicker and easier and more understandably? So what we've done here is we, you know, one, Solutions like ContractPod AI enable us, enable my team and our sales team, our procurement team, our HR teams to access contracts wherever they are, from a cell phone, from a mobile. If you're on the beach, you know, my team constantly tells me, has to tell me to stop working because I, I will work when I'm on vacation. I will work at three in the morning and there, I'll get messages, please go to bed. <laughs> um, so what we did was we said our goal is to easily automate the extraction of data from contracts, which was one of my key requirements for any contract management solution. Two, uh, you know, we began with the pandemic especially, but we've been able to move to even more collaborative work through both tools within Contract Pod AI, but also tools that are available in other systems. If you're a if you're a Google Docs user or a Office 365 user, you can access various 
tools that allow you to collaborate in real time with your colleagues and your and your and your even your outside counsel are being able to go in, share a document in Teams, and say, if you join the conversation, let's work on this together while we're on the phone, so that we can actually see what we're doing. Uh, we've been able to bring forward the way the way we get into and review documents by having a a system that shows us doc, our, our contracts as records, database records, as opposed to a just a mess of files. One big issue that we had to overcome previously, of course, was going from actual SharePoint to a SharePoint-like system to ContractPod AI or any sort of digital record-based repository is you actually get to see documents as one record rather than oh, we've got 55 copies of a file in here, all of which are, are named V1, V2, final, really final, truly final, which is, uh, you know, I, I saw this the other day in, in another discussion I was having with a bunch of lawyers, how we're terrible at naming documents. So, you know, you know one said that she had a file on her desktop that was named version seven final underscore really final underscore final final which shows you how difficult it is to manage manage things without a appropriate system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always the easiest thing because people do have their own systems, but by working in this sort of repository where you get to see documents in terms of V1, V2, V3, be able to go back and forth and see changes through the tool, a comparison tool and all that, really assists in having everybody on the same page, on the same version, uh, and make sure that you're not having an issue where where Jane Smith in sales is making changes on V3. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, everybody else is working on V7, mm -hmm. version 7, version 3. Of course, everybody got that. I shouldn't have to explain that. So what does that lead to ultimately? Of course, you know, I've already said I've already led got to this point. You do have a better management of your agreement process. Right. You get to see where things have been done in time and maintain an audit trail of the changes. Uh, you know, I, I take this as kind of the typical sales legal fight that everybody wants to talk about. But I, I do enjoy, and this is a, a, I would say that this is negative partisanship right here. I do enjoy when, when someone says, but we submitted it, and it turns out they submitted it five minutes ago when they told someone else they submitted it a week ago. Yes, but that's this is ultimately and that's just, you know, me taking some delight in somebody else's suffering. I guess that's shed in Freud. Uh, but ultimately, you get to see your documents being updated in near real time and be able to track what's going on, be able to see that the business our, our, our business teams are able to rely that when they go into the system and download something. They're getting, once they've been notified, the most recent document that they can get. And if there are changes or there have been, or it's waiting on a approval, make, approval process, or if it's out for signature, they can see the status. Internally, we're able to take notes and keep track of what's going on with the documents. We're able to assign things to the appropriate people. And finally, you know, looking at this results column, you, we're able to go back and say, hey, you know what, we don't need, we, we spend five minutes on this type of document. And, you know, one good thing that we can show is if you're on, if you're on our paper, if you're on Amelia IPsoft paper, your deal got done in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You want to do it on the customer paper? Great. We can do that. But I now can prove in many times that working on that takes significantly longer to close a deal with no, and, and one thing that I, I've heard a lot and that I, I like to point out is, oh, well, we have to use the customer's paper. It will take a long time. You know, I'm able to show that, you know, other customers have used our paper and taken a much shorter time because we've gotten down to exactly what we need. We, we're not putting in hundreds of pages of documentation about how to perform a professional service when we're selling software. And you're, you're able to install it by yourself. Is it work every time? Of course not. But the more we're able to show the value of data and how contracts can be managed better through data, better through 
better through analytics and ultimately, uh, you know, look at what is working and what is not working in a document, we're able to drive deals faster, which ultimately keeps everybody happier. Um, I, I know I know that I only have a few minutes to talk. So, Charles, am I doing OK so far? You are. You are. Actually, one, one of the things that I, I liked from what you said is uh, it, it's in fact, very topical, again, is exactly what we're talking about here, data-driven approach to digital transformation. So you've gone through that transformation, and one of the things that you were just mentioning was now you've got the data to be able to kind of show which way is faster. Do you use our paper, you know, that is IPsoft's paper, Amelia's paper, or your customer's paper? And it's really nice that now you're not just guessing at this. You're not saying, well, I think. It's, it's really that you, you've got statistics behind it, and you can say, well, no, actually, this is the better way to do it and convince the customer about this or convince the partner about this, et cetera. So, again, that, that really puts a lot of um, a lot of good control or, or at least, you know, it becomes an empirical conversation, not a not a gut feel conversation, which uh, which often derails, uh, I guess, a lot of business. That's right. And I think I think a big part of that is we have data, mm -hmm. but. The more another big part of this is also working with working well with the other side. Yeah, and I yeah. think that it, that one key thing that has to happen no matter what here is internal departments and external lawyers, of course. But internal law departments and our, our people, you have to work well with outside with the other side's attorneys and procurement team, or if we're purchasing, obviously you're selling our procurement team and our lawyers. To make sure that this goes smoothly, so that's something beyond the data. You know, one one thing we can do, of course, is go and say, "Look, we actually have data that shows what we've done with other customers." Yes. If you need access to that, I'm happy to share with you some reporting or give you an idea of what we've seen. But get, being able to be open and frank and have that clear discussion is very important. Yeah. Um, and you know, I I think ultimately. Well, the more data you have and the more data we are able to show and extrapolate from and ultimately see where things end up, we're able to move more. We're able to move much more quickly. Um, and part of that's because we can see if, if we're never getting our way on one point, why why should we waste time asking for that? Yeah. Uh, when we know that every if we can look at the data and say, hey, we've been able to transform transform this by looking by going and saying we don't see this working but we do know that this this point will work yeah. and most people will accept that we've got we've not only had a, a a digital transformation but we've had a human transformation as well in how we're relating with with our customers with our suppliers and even with our colleagues interesting i i also kind of liked what you said at the beginning which was uh, that and, and that in fact it's almost one of those um, eye openers to say, hey, are you telling me that, you know, a file share program doesn't work or a SharePoint doesn't work for all the contracts? Why not? Um, so that was interesting. You kind of even brought that up and saying, yes, we, here's the complexity of it. How do you name these things? And, and the fact that they're just files as opposed to being records and such. So good point. I mean, look, the, the fact of the matter is, is I'm a big believer in in data-driven record-based contract management as opposed to document-based contract management. Right. And I, I'm sure I'm sure some people have, uh, you know, I, I talk about this a lot. I, I It's one of my favorite things to say is that if you're document-based, you're still going back and reading everything. You have to st search through everything. You can't get it out quickly. You can't find it out, out properly. Yeah. If you, if, if you are not document based, if you're record based, you're able to dig in very quickly and find things out. And that is not and that is ultimately the the thing that can speed it up, because if I can go in and the record has been abstracted, whether by AI or in, you know, previously we had to do it by manual review, you're able to go in and do that much more quickly and be able to find it, target it and get out and get the response back quicker. Uh, I mean, all of this sounds to me, you know, all, what I'm saying here is all related to turnaround time, yeah. but it's also related to having good data. Yep, that's great. Excellent. Jerry, thank you very much for kind of sharing with us uh, on your personal and, and, you know, Amelia's journey on that digital journey. Uh, oh, sorry, digital transformation journey. So that, that's, that's excellent. How did you get here?
My pleasure. Well, whoops. Let me back out of there. Let me stop the slide presentation. And what I'd like to do now is maybe what we can do is uh, have a couple of um, um, get into the panel session. So having heard what Jared just talked about, about here's what it looks like to both go on that journey, but then here's what the end goal is like. This is what it's like to kind of already have a system like this. Um, so keep that in mind as I ask you the, uh, the, the next couple of questions. Um, first question I'd like to ask is, what are the measurable KPIs when it comes to the digital transformation of in-house legal teams? So what's really important from that perspective? And again, uh, Jerry, since you've been talking about this, why don't I start with you and then we'll, we'll kind of work our way around. Sure. Um, so I, I just, I actually just mentioned this and I do think that the, the driver for every legal department, what we're constantly told and this is from conversation with other GCs, heads of legal, C uh, CLOs, is everybody's always focused on turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, and I think turnaround is an easily measurable KPI because you can look at it and say, how long does it take you to turn around the document? Mm -hmm. And you're able to see where there are outliers, where there are other, where there are other faults, where things have slipped through the crack. All of that is is really something that you can find by measuring your turnaround time. Yep. But that has to be compared to length of document, type of document, uh, differences in the scope of, let's say, sale price. So ultimately, you know, if you can measure all of those factors mm -hmm. and run them up against each other, mm -hmm. you're you're in a good place. And so w one thing that comes to mind there is it's much quicker to review an NDA than it is to review a 150 page master services agreement. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not a, I, I personally am not a big fan of legal department, SLA service level agreements and term and measuring act on actual, like, did you turn something around in two days outside of that idea that there has to be some awareness that not every document is the same. Yeah. Uh, and also, that, that doesn't take into account third-party paper. It doesn't take into account customer uh, counterparty turnaround time. But it's easy to look at it and say, okay, at least on our paper, we have, you know, 15-minute turnaround time, and I'm making up numbers. Right. We can turn around our NDA if it's come back within five minutes with a red line, let's say. But if you give me a... I received, my team received a 22 page non-disclosure agreement, but I don't really understand why it was 22 pages mm -hmm. the other day. Mm -hmm. And we started laughing. So it's it's the, these, but turnaround is your easiest measurable yep. number. Nice. And then you can run that against other data points if you've got it properly recorded in the system. Yep. Price, uh, whose paper, scope of deal, length of length of the documents and all of that. Okay. But I, I think that's the, the core one that everybody looks at first is how long and how fast does it take you to take you to complete a transaction? How long does it take you to do a first pass? Yes. Nice. Thank you, Jerry. Ben, can I bump that over to you? So what, what's your perspective in terms of the measurable KPIs in that digital transformation journey? And, and specifically, you know, because you've been through this a couple of times as well uh, in bringing on new big systems, legal automation, uh, CLM systems, et cetera. So what's your perspective? What would be the KPIs that you would recommend? So we, um, at the start of the project, we always define our KPI, KPIs against value and performance. So yeah. the value ones are fairly straightforward. As you say, as you raised at the beginning, it's that um, how quickly you hit your ROI. Um, are you uh, realizing the savings or the sort of the optimization that you set out to achieve? And those are, I think, quite easy because they're quite easy to turn into quantitative data points that we can measure and we can track. Um, I think on the performance side, that's where it's more challenging. I think uh, mm -hmm. Jerry gives a great example around turnaround time. It's something where, yes, there's a sort of, there is a tangible business benefit, but you're not implementing the technology to make the legal department cheaper or to produce heads or anything. You're implementing it because you think you can fundamentally improve the quality of the service you're providing to the business. Right. So I think turnaround time is a great one, and we track that really carefully. Um, I think there's a sort of range of other ones. You know, I think depending on the nature of the project, we can often track engagement levels, adoption levels, you know, sort of technology that allows um, uh, our stakeholders in the business to interact with us via technology. We're able to sort of track how far that's gone, how regularly people use it, you know, how long they spend on sort of certain tasks. So there's a real breadth, but I think the key for us is being really clear 
what are we tracking because it's um, having a value benefit and what are we tracking because it's having a performance quality benefit um, and make sure those two stay aligned. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, that's good. And George, you have an opportunity, a little bit of a unique opportunity, both having been, you know, kind of on that side of the legal team where you've worked kind of in industry, uh, and then now you're actually kind of in, in charge of the part of the implementation team, the legal engineering team at Contract Pond. And you have a, a great opportunity to see this in terms of a number of different customers that you're bringing onto new systems. So what's your perspective in terms of the KPIs of, of, of kind of pulling the customer along on that digital journey? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think turnaround time is quite a, a popular um, KPI, but also um, with implementations, quite often we can do KPIs. It's really around adoption. So the fact that you've actually implemented a system will allow you to um, suddenly gain greater governance and transparency of what's going on. So you can build KPIs around that. And then really it's driving um, adoption as well. Um, because by showing that people are using the system again, you're showing that there's greater control, greater transparency, the collection of data. You've got all those benefits that are coming simply through the adoption process. And that's something certainly um, as a software company, it's, it's very um, straightforward and simple for us to provide those type of uh, data and statistics to help you. When you say adoption, though, it, it's it's not just the legal team's adoption that you're talking about. You're talking about like, you know, is the rest of the organization using? Yeah, well, uh, exactly. So it's numbers of users across the business. It, you can also look at it. It's simply numbers of contracts going through the system. Yeah. Um, and through that, you can say so you can then um, provide greater governance. So you can provide KPIs around the, the governance piece, compliance. Um, risk analysis that you can then provide because you simply have the data in a, and the documents somewhere where you can um, then do that analysis because previously that would just simply have not been possible. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's good. I mean, uh, basically from in terms of the KPIs, what we heard were, you know, turnaround time is pretty important, a number of other factors, the, the more common ones, I suppose, the ROI, the savings, optimization, uh, you know, it, are, was there time savings? But then another really good one that uh, George, you brought up there was the adoption. And adoption, not just in the legal department, but actually within the rest of the organization as well. So again, pretty key, key points. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, number two, I mean, or, or my next question, what is the most common timeline for achieving optimal results? And can you give us any examples or from you know your, your legal teams, et cetera? Ben, do you think I, I might start with you on that on that side? What would you say in terms of optimal results? We're on this digital transformation journey, you know, what, what are you gonna tell your more senior management to say, here, here's here's the timeline that we're gonna have for this? Yeah, I think it's a really good question because I think if you're unrealistic about that or um, you fundamentally get it wrong, I think you make your implementation and adoption program a lot more difficult. Um, my sense is that, um, or at least the policy we've always adopted here, is that we budget for a year to two years to get this sort of thing fully adopted and fully implemented and working, and that's the period over which we'd be tracking it and carefully making sure that we're staying on target. But we want to be showing benefits much faster than that. So I think we try and structure our program so that within the first four to six weeks, we're starting to show some benefit, even if it's a proof of concept or a pilot, but we're able to bring our users and our stakeholders on that journey with us so that they can see you know, what it is we're doing, why they should buy into it, you know, it's exciting, it's positive, and then structure it such that the benefits continue to trickle through so that there's sort of, you know, every month that passes, we're able to show some progress, we're able to offer some functionality, we're able to offer something that keeps people bought in and wanting to participate. Um, so although I would say, you know, yeah, these, these, these things take time, you have to be realistic. Um, definitely, we've realized that the more you can stagger those benefits and, and bring people with you, ultimately the overall timeline will be shorter and uh, I think the overall success is likely to be greater. So in other words, a um, kind of a, a quick deployment schedule is pretty important or or at the very least to have some kind of a phased approach to be able yeah. to really, really kind of capitalize on the momentum. 
That's exactly it. And I think that initial deployment can be very basic. I think there's a temptation when you know what you're trying to achieve and there's something exciting in that end goal, I think there's a temptation to try to get to there immediately. Um, but those initial things, yeah, super basic, but just enough to keep people bought in and interested. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. You're right. I, I think whenever you're thinking about a large project, it's uh, I think it's really easy to think, uh, not not in an agile way, of, but, but kind of in a more structured way of thinking, it's going to be all or nothing and it's it's coming in and it's going to be a year before we get this but but then again you're right that that whole i think at the beginning of the project is when you've got most of the team is really excited about it they're interested it's it's they're keen to kind of get started so so good good really really good point george you've had the opportunity again to, to speak to a lot of clients on this and, and I, in fact i think you've you've even done some expedited deployments what's your perspective on that yeah i think um that's one of the biggest changes at the moment is that we um, historically with legal IT it was the delivery of a software package and yes. on go live date the software company would disappear and the legal team would be stuck with a new system that they would quite often very quickly fall out of love with and it would never achieve what it was supposed to achieve. Um, one of the benefits of moving towards a, a software as a service type um, provision is that you get that ongoing relationship with the software provider. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because it allows, as Ben was saying, that phased approach mm -hmm. and the expansion of use and functionality for the system. And we certainly um, look at that over a normally over a two year period. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's two years from go live date. So, as Ben will say, there will normally be some very quick, easy wins that we can do. But then it's a matter of growing the system with the users. So, as they get familiar with certain parts of the system, you can then bring in additional functionality and um, grow the use and again grow the uh, the adoption through that. Yeah. If you nowadays with a lot of the IT, it's got so much functionality that if you go big bang, people simply won't use half of it and they'll get fed up with the other half because it doesn't do everything that they want. Yes. So it's much more of a phased approach that, that we certainly take um, with clients. That's great. Well, thank you, George, for that perspective. And uh, Jerry, uh, what, what is your sense in terms of that, in terms of the timeline for optimal results from the system? I was going to say, I think that it does also depend on the size of the organization and how many people have to be involved in general. Yeah. Um, you know, we're a, we're a mid-sized business. We're not nearly as big as Fujitsu, mm -hmm. but you know, I still, I still would put it in about, you know, I may not go one to two years, but I'd say six to 12, 15 months, you've got to be working on this for people to really see it. Yeah. Uh, you see some results very quickly, but there are other results that take a much longer time to, to show up. And in and of course, this goes back to what I was saying about data, where as you're getting as you're getting information in, you've got to develop enough data. Uh oh. <laughs> in the judge whether or not you're seeing results. Yes. Yes, excellent. All right, good. Thank you, Jerry. Um, now, how much clarity or visibility does the industry have in terms of determining the impact of technology deployment? And again, by industry, of course, we're talking about the, uh, the legal space, uh, you know, corporate legal. So with that, uh, George, would you kind of share your thoughts first? Yeah, I think, I think there is um, certainly increasing amount of uh, clarity and visibility now. Um, the uh, software companies are becoming a lot better at helping GCs um, a set KPIs and then providing the data that then shows that these goals are being hit to show that um, implementation is going and is being successful. Um, one thing that um, we're very aware of is that GCs aren't naturally salesmen um, so that's something which the software company can help with selling the, the um, IT across the business and also selling the success of that and how you um, can put
put that in terms of KPIs as well. So from a financial perspective, return on investment, yeah. um, that perspective as well. So I think it is something which um, is increasing that in that clarity um it's still got some way to go but i think it's certainly something which is improving okay it's an improvement it's not a black box anymore jerry any thoughts on that in terms of uh, kind of clarity in terms of the the visibility you know within the industry of technology i i, I think that the that there's still a lot of learning to be done in the legal technology industry serving as far as it goes serving in-house counsel and so on um and uh, i think that we're run that there are contract management all these new tools are coming out there's a ton of different companies doing di approaching from different ways and what needs to be shown is is that what is going to best benefit internally and you know one one thing that i think and going to what i think george just said is not every GC is also a salesperson. Right. They're not. They're not always able. They, they can understand how it benefits, but they may not be able to express it in X to the rest of their leadership team or to others within the organization. Um, so I think you're. What we're starting to see is a lot of enthusiasm for techno technical solutions, technological solutions. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of people who feel burned by prior attempts, um, and that's just. That's just one of the issues that were that I think legal tech vendors have to face. Um, I think the one thing that comes out that you, that we don't often think about because we're stuck because lawyers think about privilege, but we don't think about uh, we don't always think about the security of information. So I think the complexity of implementation is often is often ignored but also the compliance with various security rules and requirements of organizations that may not exist in, in obviously it exists because you don't want to defold your client's information, but some of the, some of the benefits of that lawyers have as a profession yeah. are not, are still have to be approached by the vendors. But I think clarity is improving. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had less, do you actually know what we do speeches or how does this actually help me yeah. in the past year or so than I did when I first started, when I first started here at Amelia IP soft five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It, it, it's quite, quite interesting what you said there about, uh, you know, that maybe a lot of GCs or a lot of legal folk have been burned in the past uh, by previous attempts that didn't work out and stuff. I, I, I you know, let me dig in, into that just a tiny bit. Like, what is the biggest recommendation you have to say, hey, here's here's the way not to get burned or, or you know, vendors, this is really what you should be doing for clients? I, I mean, I think, I think, and I, I believe Ben mentioned this earlier, is one, you know, we really do need to be able to see how it works with a subset of data. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm the, we're a software company. We do pilots for our, for our customers to see how it works. Yeah. Uh, you know, at least... Just telling me that your option is a free trial is not going to work for a, for a law department, right? Um, because we actually want to see that, but also understand what the tools are that the teams are using. A, a lot of companies use Salesforce. I think, and speaking about contract management only right now, mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not able to support a Salesforce integration or you don't have some way of pulling information back and forth, it's I, I would say that's becoming table stakes. Um, you know, and I think one issue that, again, talking about contract lifecycle management vendors, things that were very important that you that you that got sold as a benefit five years ago, are again table stakes. If you're not doing automatic OCR, if you're not able to search within all the files, if you're not able to do that, that's just things that your software should do out of the box today. Right. Um, yep. Where. Where I think you see the burning, and we we where where GCs and legal technology professionals are once bitten, twice shy, yeah. is there are a lot of vendors out there. It is hard to make a choice. Yes, and you really need there there there's going to be a there. You, well, sorry, what we need is a better way, and I think certain organizations like Clock and the ACC Legal Ops 
are working on this, better ways to actually vet and uh, and figure out what you need as an organization based on your based on your level in the legal tech timeline. But vendors have to be aware and do their due diligence on the customer as well. If you're not if you're processing thirty thousand contracts a month. Mm-hmm. Your needs for contract management software are quite a bit different than someone who sees five contracts a month. Yeah, yeah. And a one size fit all application doesn't actually fit anybody. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, working very closely collaboratively with the vendor, I suppose, is, is pretty, probably the, the key. Making sure that they really understand what is what is it that I'm after. Uh, so I, I I think that's pretty pretty critical as well. And that that frankly comes from a, another conversation that you and I had had in the previous. Uh, uh, where you had made some recommendations to another, another GC saying, hey, one of the first places to start is make sure you really understand what you're getting here. So so pretty important. Excellent. Thank you. Ben, uh, what, what's your, your perspective on the visibility, um, you know, on, on determining these systems, the, on technology deployments? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to agree with everything that's been said previously. I think historically this has been quite a weak area, and I think everyone's wising up and it's getting much better. Yes. Um, I think people have been burnt. My view is that the vendors need to be really transparent about what the software does and doesn't do, and they need to really embrace pilots and want to engage in that. Yeah. Um, but I think on the corporate legal side, I think people need to not look at software as a magic wand, and they need to sort of properly stop and engage with it and understand the nuts and bolts, because yeah. it's very tempting to sort of buy the magic wand argument, but you probably won't see the value of what you're purchasing if you don't yeah. give it that degree of engagement that it really merits. So yeah. it all comes down to pilots for me. If, a really well executed pilot with everyone fully bought in and committed. I think the prospects of it then being a success is so much greater. Hmm, excellent. That, that's a really good suggestion. Thank you for that. Good. Yeah, let me take a moment now at this uh, at this stage. If I can ask the audience a question, and then let, let's kind of just reflect on that for a moment, and then we'll continue with a couple more questions and then bring this to a close. So I'm going to open up the polling uh, right now. So I'm going to start the polling, and the question that we have here is. How long do you think it takes to recoup a financial investment in legal digital transformation? So again, talking about legal digital transformation, how long does it take to recoup your financial investment? And then we've got less than a year, one to less than two years, two to less than three years, and three years plus. And if you can start now, that would be great. And again, the audience, should have the ability to just click on uh, one of those buttons to select. I'll give everybody a moment or two. Hmm. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, wonderful. I started to think that my my system had frozen. You know, there wasn't seeing any activity there, so that's good. So a number of people are now starting, and we're just going to give it another moment or two. And again, the big question is, how long does it take to recoup? Or do you think that it takes to recoup a financial investment in legal digital transformation? All right. And I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one, and... And now, all right, excellent. Uh, and the results, uh, let me see. I, uh, I'm not sure if I can show the res- hmm. Hopefully you're seeing this on the screen, but the results that I'm seeing are basically, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an even split between less than one year and one to two years. So about 28% each, so about a third of the audience on, on both of those almost. And then we're talking about uh, two to three years, uh, 42% of the audience agreed there. And three years plus, nobody said, you know, nobody selected that one. So at least that's good to know that it's not a long, long-term uh, solution. And I think modern society basically is not uh, not into really long-term plays anymore, I think. So that's kind of reflected there. Interesting, two to three years. Uh, uh, panelists, what do you guys think? Does that, does that sort of resonate with you guys? Anyone, Jerry? I was going to say, yeah, and I, again, this goes to what I, I think we've just, we just mentioned and Ben just mentioned as well, that you're, you're looking at, it depends on the scale, the size of your organization, and how, and how quickly people are willing to adapt and move with it, yeah. as well as, you know, one of the most difficult parts of any organization, which is training. 
Right. Um, yeah. But I, I think I think this makes sense. But I also would, I think a good question is what is the size of your organization, and you know, going back to these data points, looking at this is the investment is if you're a small if you're a very small organization, you can invest you can recoup the investment in less than a year. If right. you are spending, if you're a, a huge business, a huge corporation, you could be looking two years, three years before you really start seeing the true recovery from this. And any perspective from your side, given that you're, well, you're with a mega big organization, Fujitsu is huge and it's, uh, you know, dispersed around the globe, multinational. What, what, what's your perspective on that? Um, the expectation here is that it's less than a year or one year. So oh, it's, yes, it, okay. for us, it's, um, it's a question of structuring things in such a way that we can deliver to that one year return on investment, because, um, if we're going outside of that, that's kind of breaking the corporate expectations and you've got a much more difficult job to uh, sell it internally and get people bought in. So that really, really kind of emphasizes that point that uh, was brought up earlier about doing a some kind of a quick deployment model or at least doing it in phases so that you can show some results immediately, show some ROI right away. That's, that's yeah. good. That's really, really good. George, have you ever had any conversations with some of our clients along that side? Yes, I think normally it's... Um... They're looking at what the one to two years. Uh -huh. yeah. um, that's certainly how we will normally look at it from a uh, implementation perspective. Yeah. Um, and try and let's say with the phase, more phased approach on implementation, um, and to drive adoption over that period to make sure that ROI is is hit within that. Okay. So that's certainly the, where we would look. Okay. So one to two years. Yeah, you know, so it, it does sort of uh, kind of span that that time frame anywhere from less than a year, which sounds like a pretty aggressive, but you know what, necessary kind of uh, thing in our new environment, uh, you know, to like two or three years where most of the audience is kind of uh, you know, focusing in on. Uh, and anyway, interesting. Um, another question for you is um, uh, what are corporate legal teams looking for today, uh, specifically? on that digital transformation journey. Is there anything that kind of re really resonates as saying, hey, this is what I needed when I started that journey? And, and again, um, Ben, maybe I can start with you on this one. Um, so for us, it's definitely being able to enhance the quality of the services we're providing from the business. It's right. moving the legal team out of just being the guys who do red lines and turn documents and into sort of that close business advisors who can bring that extra dimension, that insight, that analysis that takes you beyond just signing contracts and allows you to sort of, you know, the predictive analytics, the sort of insight to the business in a way that a CEO and CFO wouldn't have without that particular set of specialism. So all around quality and insight and kind of stepping ourselves up to being true sort of trusted advisors to the business. Excellent. All right. Thank you. And George, any thoughts there? Yeah, it's, it's um, very much around, um, uh looking at the wider picture a lot of people are already partly digital so it's where they are in the journey and um quite often they'll have different systems doing different pieces so it's for a lot of them it's actually what are the mi missing pieces in the puzzle mm -hmm. um which bits are we now looking for but also how do we simplify this quite often we hear that for example uh legal teams will have several different repositories for documents and they just want to pull it together in one central repository, again, to gain that. Um, also for um, contract pod AI and my team in particular, one um, particular focus is around the AI capabilities, the, um, as Ben was saying, the predictive uh, analytics and the ability to extract the information out of the documents once they're in the repository. So it, it's those areas where um, we're probably seeing the um, greatest interest and, and take up. Okay. And Jerry, when you started your journey, what, what, what has been kind of the top of mind for you in terms of your legal team saying this is what we need? I, I think to, well, for the legal team, I think it's been able to, it's being able to work collaboratively and ensure that our delivery of our service to our the rest of the bigger team here is improved and ultimately uh, a positive experience for them. Uh, but there's also a strategic and tactical standpoint that we take that 
we're able to better guide the the deal making and being able to you know look at a bigger picture is part of this transformation rather than how does this one deal affect us to does this does this deal affect other other things going on at the company does it affect other sales uh and then be able to advise on both a big picture and a direct sale uh, and on the specific the specific deal going forward has been a big part of where we've where we've gone to with this okay that's good um all right one last question gentlemen which is the data-driven approach to digital transformation what is your one takeaway that you would like to share with the audience share with another gc out there to say if you were going to start this journey this is the big thing this is the, the one thing you got to focus on what, what's your one key takeaway um and again uh, maybe ben why don't i start with you on that one again too uh, I think the, the key bit of advice I give is start with the basics. Get your foundational data right. Understand what's in your contracts. Get your real basics and then start building up from there and move up the complexity curve. Because I think there's a temptation to go straight to the sort of cutting edge top of the complexity. But if right. you haven't got your basic building blocks and know from a sort of data perspective what's happening in your organization, it's really hard to then sustainably build that digital transformation. So I'd say, yeah, start with the basics and be really careful to bring your stakeholders with you. And stakeholders, that's pretty important. Okay, that's good. Jerry, what, what are your thoughts on that? The one big can I just uh, can I just take what Ben said and just repeat it? <laughs> um, but be, sure, beyond, you could do that as long as you add something at the end. Okay, so I, I do think I do think that's that's a big key part of this is know what the basic thing know what you're basically trying to accomplish. Yeah, if you are if if what you are trying to transform is your department if, if your transformation is around delivery if your transformation is around knowing what's in the documents what is your goal because different different approaches will be will ch your approach will change depending on what you're trying to do with the document if you're trying to automate and get legal out of the way yeah. you want to focus on template development automated automated review right. and well, that first, if you're trying to grab hold of 20 years of documents that have never been in a system, your focus is on migration and analysis and and analytics. So I think I think for anybody who would be starting this today, I would or looking at this, go through what you're trying to accomplish. What's your core goal? Is it is it ma uh, process management? Is it workflow management? Is it predictive? Is it analytics? Is it is it automation? Is it, or is it gener document generation? Yeah. And go from there and then build a solution, you know, build a solution or select your solution or figure out how you're going to implement this mm -hmm. from that lens because that's going to drive the rest of the process. Nice. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Absolutely. You know what your goals are and kind of figure Get your, get your mind wrapped around that first, which is a really, really good sound piece of advice. And George, having seen a number of these implementations, what, what is your piece of advice that you would say, hey, this is the one thing that you need to think about? Yeah, I think it is um, know what your goals are. And we've all talked about phased implementation um, and not the big bang. So what do you want? What are your easy hits and then what is going to come further down the line and i think that's something which we found recently with covid for example is a lot it clarified for a lot of people what their first up targets were which was typically central repository which everybody can access remotely was yeah. the number one because that's what they needed to carry on working right. so it's work out what your kpis are work out what your goals are and then basically get out there and, and talk to software people, software companies like us. So, um, and in doing that, look for ones who are talking about staying with you through that transformation journey as well, because I think that's very important. So it's somebody who, uh, a company who's willing to work with you over that implementation period, that phase period. Right. Um, that, that thing is, is very important. 
Yeah, that, that's good advice. I mean, so basically on this last part, the key takeaways, focus on the basics. Uh, and well, frankly, know what your goals are so that you can focus on the basics that you need done. So that was excellent advice there too. And then the idea of phased implementation, interesting that it came up a couple of times in our conversation, very important aspect there to be able to show progress quickly, gain that momentum, get that momentum going. And then, uh, and then frankly, good point also, George, in terms of just uh, having there somebody who's uh, kind of had holding through the process, um, which which is pretty important too. And, and I have heard of a um, um, yep, number of complaints against software vendors. A lot of times it's easy for a software vendor to think, uh, you know, very tunnel vision, thinking that I sell software, I gave you the software, we sold you the software, you know, good luck, you're on your own, uh, make it happen. And, you know, rather than kind of going through the implementation. So again, good advice there. Make sure that you know what you're buying and you really need a solution, not, not just a piece of software. So with that, let me just jump one more, one more slide that I want to, to show, which is uh, for anybody in the audience, if you'd like a little bit more information on the digital transformation process, we do have a free ebook, which is the three stages of legal digital transformation. Uh, it has been very popular. You'll find it um, down here. The, there's a little uh, bit.ly uh, link to it. So that's easy enough to, to jot down. And with that, what I would like to say is thank you to everybody. Thank you to the panelists, Ben, Jerry, George, for joining me and for having a, a fascinating conversation about a data-driven digital transformation approach uh, to your legal departments. And again, congratulations on gentlemen that you guys actually have implemented. George, in your case, you've implemented a whole bunch of them. Uh, so again, bringing this up and live is certainly a big accomplishment. And, and again, really, really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your experiences with the rest of the audience and your contract lot as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.